Let's go ahead and get rolling today. Um, thank you all for coming, and we, we appreciate your presence, and we've got some friendly faces out there. I know uh, wonderful people. We've got uh, Bob Willie, our fearless leader, uh, friends of the Georgetown Library, Fogel, uh, is here with us, and, and Vinny Dees Moore, a uh, wonderful friend of the library, with a lowercase n and capital F there, uh, enjoying her beans coffee as well. <laughs> we love beans here, uh, keeping them in business for sure. We have a great program uh, for you today, and it's uh, being videoed, so uh, it will be available online afterwards at the Georgetown County Library YouTube page, so you can review it if you're here in person with us or of course view it for the first time if not um, so have a look at it there uh, and we want to say thank you to Aaron Brickle our our videographer for uh, videoing this and editing it um, and we have a couple more of these programs it's a, a cycle a series of programs that we're doing uh, in concert with our friend wonderful friend uh, the library, the North Inlet Winya Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve, which is a mouthful. Yeah, it's not, not easily done, which is why we simply call it the Near or the NER if you're from up north. Uh, so uh, N E R R is the acronym, and uh, you know, we might, our guest today might talk a little bit more about that. Uh, she'll definitely talk about what they do. Uh, behind the signs that you've probably seen at Hobcall Barony as you pass by, uh, what's going on behind uh, those signs there? Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's great work, great stewardship work in terms of conservation, preservation of our estuaries uh, where the, the rivers uh, meet the, the sea, the ocean, and all that, that wildlife, that, uh, uh, the plant life that's going on there and the waterways, uh, so it's a, a very vivid, uh, a vivid and important uh, place uh, and beautiful right there on our coastline. And they're the stewards of that. They do a lot of research, a lot of education, and they want to share it with the public. So they want, they want us to come in uh, and join them, uh, and especially in this period after COVID, they want to open it up to us. So they're really inviting the public in and that's uh, what this cycle of programs is doing with the library uh, to really open up an invitation. Um, and this is their 30th year, so happy birthday uh, to NEAR. They, they started back in 1992 uh, in this area. Uh, so they've been around for, for a long time uh, doing good work there behind the signs. Um, this, this will be the third presentation in the cycle. We do have a couple more we want to uh, avail you of coming up at the Southern Georgetown Library on Thursday of this week, Thursday, September 15th at 3 p.m. And then one more at our Carver's Bay location on Saturday, September 17th at 11 a.m. Uh, so you can uh, catch presenters uh, talking about how to get to know the, the near out there. And today, uh, we have uh, a staff person, Maeve Snyder, from NEAR uh, with us. She is the Coastal Training Program Coordinator. Um, so be another big title. I don't know if there's a, an acronym you can make out of that. Yes, sir. There is. OK. <laughs> All right. They, can, they, they are masters of acronyms out there. So. Uh, but Maeve, is, uh, she's originally from Pennsylvania. She grew up in the upstate uh, at Clemson a little bit. And then she uh, got her, uh, her bachelor's in biology up the road uh, at Coastal Carolina University, so not far, uh, up 17 from, from us, and did some good work, I know, with the Georgetown RISE program and Dr. Martin, uh, Pamela Martin there. And then went off uh, to Columbia, to University of South Carolina, uh, got her master's in biology, and then returned to us here on the coast uh, where she's doing good work for uh, NEAR. So Maeve Snyder here with us today, uh, Coastal Training Program Coordinator for NEAR. And what, what is the acronym for that? CPC. Oh, OK. All right. Well, I could, probably could have figured that out. So please welcome her. 
Thank you, Dan. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> that was a very nice intro. Um, thank you all so much for taking the time to come out here this morning. I'm really excited to tell you about the NEAR, where I work. Um, it's a really long name, but it's a really special place. And hopefully by the end you feel like it's familiar and it's a part of our community and hopefully you'll come out and visit us there because it really is, it's unique, it's important, it's special. Um, we're excited to celebrate its 30th anniversary. Um, and so I think I'll start off. So I am not Jen Plunkett, but I did borrow her PowerPoint. Um, Jen is our stewardship coordinator, so I work with her. Um, and our goal is for you all to know the NEAR. So it's the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. We are a national system. There's now 30 reserves all across the country, and we have two here in South Carolina. Um, and that's actually pretty special. Not every state has one, not every state is um, you know, a coastal state, but of the coastal states, um, we have pretty good coverage all around the country. But I mean, you know, you can see the whole Texas Gulf Coast only has one, so we're really lucky we have two of these special places in South Carolina. Um, and I wanna say we're a small group today, so if y'all have any questions, just, just go ahead and we can, you know, have a discussion. Um, it doesn't just have to be me chatting the whole time. <laughs> So the NEAR system, um, it's based around estuaries, right? NEAR is national estuarine, which is like the adjective form of estuary. Um, research, research is kind of the key word of what we actually do in these places and reserves, so they're protected spaces. So it's a lot to break down, but, um, but I just wanted you all to know like, you know, if you're ever traveling around, you can go visit other NEARs. Um, and they really do like cover the entire country, including the Great Lakes. I didn't know this when I started in my job, but you can have a freshwater estuary. It's not just where rivers meet the ocean, but it can also be where a river meets a large, you know, body of water like a Great Lake. So the, the NEAR system is made up of federal state partnerships which sounds like a ton of fun, right? Like that's just sounds great. But really what that means is like there's two entities that sort of come together to create, to fund and implement each reserve. Um, the federal part of that is NOAA. So, okay, quiz. When you guys hear NOAA, what do you think of? Weather. Yeah, weather, totally, yeah. Anything else? Park. Park? Ark. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, <laughs> like Noah's Ark. Um, actually, like, you know, fl flooding is a big part of what Noah does. Um, so points for that, points for Noah. <laughs> yeah, so, so I mean, Noah, it's not like, that's not something we talk about, like, in our everyday lives. I mean, I kind of do, but, <laughs> but it's, um, it's a federal agency. I think it's within the Department of Commerce, um, and it's the National Oceanic and atmospheric administration. So the ocean and the atmosphere. So the big things that NOAA focuses on are climate. Uh, we have a satellite here. They do a lot of like remotely sensed data, you know, um, tracking climate, weather across the entire planet. Um, weather, fisheries, because that oceanic piece, they do a lot of stuff around fisheries. And then just coastal communities. They do a lot of um, outreach for just, you know, our coastal economies, our coastal, um, you know, cities and towns. So that's, that's NOAA. When you think NOAA, think about these things. Um, and they are uh, ultimately where the funding for the reserve comes from. So those federal dollars are then um, passed to a state partner. I should have, I've spoiled it. Okay, USC, what do you think of? What's like the first thing that comes to mind with USC? Well, for me, I grew up in California. And you grew up in yeah, but we California. came first. We are older. <laughs> I think the way they're getting around that now is calling it U of SC. So I probably should have said it correctly. Well, I worked there at McKissick for about 30 years. 
Oh, you used to work at McKissick? Okay, I know the, like, the little museum there, and that's where they do all the student tours and everything. Yeah, I love McKissick. It's like really pretty and right on the horseshoe. Yeah, um, yeah. okay, so like USC. We know USC at the university. <laughs> And the mission of the reserves is to practice and promote stewardship of coasts and estuaries through research, education, and training with a place-based system of protected areas. So that's our mission. Um, I think the key words there are place-based. So we are in our communities, um, even though it's you know, a federal agency or the you know, University of South Carolina up in Columbia, we are here, we're based in Georgetown, we're based at Hobco Barony. Um, let's see. All right, continuing to break down our long acronym and name. The first part is North Inlet and Winyah Bay, and these are places. It's that place-based approach. Um, so just looking on the map, you can see here's Highway 17, and that's where, as you drive past before you go over the bridges to Georgetown, you can see those signs, that entrance to Hobcaw Barony. You've probably driven past it many times. But there's a whole world of stuff going on behind that gate. So it's actually a 17,000 acre property. It's huge. Um, and we focus on two estuaries that you can you know, access um, through Hobcaw Barony. The first is North Inlet, and that's this extensive area of tidal creeks and salt marsh. Um, and this is actually North Inlet right here. And then Winyah Bay, you know, when you drive over the bridge, that's Winyah Bay. Um, it's the third largest watershed on the East Coast. So a huge amount of land area is uh, basically drained to Winyah Bay. Winyah Bay connects us to huge parts of South Carolina, North Carolina, and even all the way up to Virginia. Five different rivers converge and then drain into Winyah Bay. So that is our, our estuary. It's where the ocean and uh, river come together. Oh, and then this picture is actually showing the watershed, right? So the watershed is all the area where rain falls and then drains to a certain body of water, like the bay. Um, and you can see it goes all the way up through eastern North Carolina, up into Virginia, all of northeastern South Carolina. And this graph is showing you the land use within our watershed. And actually, relative to a lot of places, it's relatively um, you know, natural and undeveloped, although that's changing really rapidly up in Horry County. But you can see it's like still 40% forest, scrubland, 17% um, agriculture. So we have this big, big watershed. And what that kind of means is like what happens in so many different places ultimately affects us right here, down here in Georgetown. One example of this is when we have a tropical storm that affects kind of anywhere in this watershed, we can expect to see flooding in our, in our bay and in our watershed. Um, okay, so let's go back to Hobcaw Barony. You're driving past on 17, you see this really tall list of signs. It's, you're going too fast to read it all. Um, what's going on back there? <laughs> because it can be seen kind of mysterious, although it seems like y'all have been out there before, you're kind of familiar. There's a lot of different entities hanging out at Hobcaw Barony. So I actually want to start with the top one, Hobcaw Barony. That is the Bell Baruch Foundation, um, which is a nonprofit that was set up by Bell Baruch. She um, was the daughter of Bernard Baruch, the Baruch family was a wealthy family that bought Hobcaw Barony in the early 1900s. Um, Belle, when she, before she passed away in the 60s, I believe, and I'm not an expert on the history of our property, um, if you would like to learn about the history, the Bell Baruch Foundation is really, like they, they do all of the interpretation around that, um, and they do excellent tours and, and public programs. Um, but she, donated that land and set up um, the foundation in her name and set it aside for research and for conservation and for teaching for students. And that's why we have all of these different university institutes that are based at Hobcaw Barony. 
So Clemson, so we basically have, have three university institutes, Clemson, University of South Carolina, and then Coastal and Francis Marion. So the Clemson University Institute has a focus on coastal ecology and forest science. It was founded earliest in 1968. Um, the University of South Carolina, oh, we're gonna go to coastal first. Coastal Carolina and Francis Marion more recently formed an institute for South Carolina studies that focuses on archeology span and anthropology, sort of like the human and historical side of things. And then where I work at the University of South Carolina, we have the Baruch Institute for Marine and Coastal Sciences um, that operates our marine field lab. We have like a conference center, seminar space, and then the NEAR um, is also based there. So that sort of breaks it apart. I sort of think of it like Clemson rules the land, University of South Carolina rules the sea, and then Coastal and Francis Marion have that human history side of things. <laughs> so this is our reserve staff. These are all my coworkers, and we're a small team. Um, we only have about a dozen or so staff that are full-time based at the reserve, along with um, the Marine Field Lab. We have a few University of South Carolina faculty that do research and they teach students. Um, but you can see we're, you know, we're small but mighty. Um, and that's maybe, you know, why it's hard for us to have a huge reach into the community because we can only be so many places at once. But we, we do a lot to get people out to the reserve, to get out into these natural places, and then to go out into the community. Um, to provide, you know, our mission of research and education and training. Um, I won't introduce everyone, but we are um, a really fun group to work with. I really love all my coworkers, yeah. We're very familiar with Haley and Beth. Yes, yeah, so Haley and Beth are our education well, team. They've been involved with the library for many years, over 30. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great to hear, and we're really glad the library has been such a great partner because um, I think especially during the pandemic, it was hard for us to you know, have students come to us. So, well, thank you. Um, and I just wanna sort of point out all of the different you know, places that you can come to see at the reserve. Um, the first is the Hobcaw Barony Discovery Center, and that houses educational exhibits and animals, we have fish tanks, um, so you can come like learn about the near up there. We have a whole exhibit dedicated to our water quality monitoring. Um, and then this is the Baruch Marine Field Lab. And I sort of think of that as, you know, it's, it's like an extension of USC's main campus in Columbia, based down here at the coast. And then we have a whole wing that's dedicated to the reserve. And then, so we only have these few buildings, but we can also think of it like all of this is our lab and our facilities. So we have the wonderful natural laboratory of the salt marsh and the bay, and this is really where a lot of our work happens and a lot of our education and research and everything. So I want to kind of shift gears into like what the NEAR does and, so, and help you guys to know what you can do, how you can get involved, um, how you can participate. So the first thing is public programs. I think this is the thing that if people are familiar with the NEAR, this is where they will be most familiar. Um, and we do a lot of different things all throughout the course of the year. It can be anything from... Um, you know, exhibits like our fish tanks, we'll do feeding programs, we'll do tours of our lab space. People really like to kind of see behind the lab coat and see what kind of cool research is happening. We do a lot of chemistry work, environmental chemistry. Um, we do a lot of ecology and stuff around fisheries so people can come and help sort fish. They can help with seine netting, see the kind of research that's being done back there. 
we do kayak programs and bike tours. We'll do bird watching programs. Um, anything that's sort of, you know, getting people out into nature, getting people to observe or maybe participate in some research. Um, many of these programs are free. Some we'll have a small fee um, just to help offset costs for like the kayak tours and everything. Um, and that's really like the best way we have to get people out into the ecosystem. Hobcaw Barony does have a gate, um, but when we have people sign up for free public programs, we can take them behind that gate, take them out into the marsh, take them out into nature, um, and really show them everything that's going on back there. And then you mentioned Beth and Haley, they run our K through 12 classroom programs. So apart from just public sign-up programs. We work closely with our local schools, with homeschool groups, with um, teachers, with Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. We will plan field trips. Um, we will go into schools, not so much since the pandemic, but um, you know, we, we were able to do that where we could bring animals or you know, bring different, um, I think Beth and Haley do a lot of like story time. Yeah, which is really fun. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't know the exact numbers, but I mean, I know that they, they reach so many K through 12 students over the years. And most people, if they grew up around here, they might not have been out to Hobcaw, but they'll be like, oh wait, I went on a field trip there one time in you know, fourth grade. So, um, so yeah, we, that's, that's one of the main things the NIR does and one of the main ways we, we reach out into the community. And then we take kids out into the field too. So if we can't, go to the school, we'll take them out into nature. I think these are actually some of the favorite programs that we do, because anything that gets, you know, boots muddy and gets kids, you know, hands on with nature is really great. Um, so you can see we have a salt marsh trail where we teach students like basic research techniques, really help them to learn those like the STEM skills. Um, so they'll use like a hula hoop to be a, like a quadrat where you have to count the different plant species in it. Um, or they're the students using a refractometer to measure salinity. So it's a really great hands-on learning experience for so many students. And I mean, I, got to, I was very lucky to get to do these kind of things when I was a kid and it you know, had a big impact on me, so. Um, all right, so this is um, my program at the reserve, the Coastal Training Program, or CTP. Um, the the long-winded, title would be, I'm the CTP at the NIWB NEAR. <laughs> but my program focuses not on our K through 12 students, but our adult students. I focus on decision makers, so end users and stakeholders, professional audiences. Um, this can be elected officials, um, local county government staff, it could be engineers, developers, stormwater managers, really anyone whose decisions affect our natural resources. Um, and they may or may not have had, you know, coastal science in their background, but they might need to use that science to make informed decisions. So that's the goal of my program. And I do that with a lot of different types of events. They can be hands-on in the field. So these are photos from trainings I've done around wetlands. Um, wetlands are really important. Uh, they're really important for water quality, flooding control, habitat and biodiversity. And they come up in a lot of development issues, stormwater issues. And so like our, you know, our decision making community, they need to know how to identify wetlands. If you're like looking to build on a property, you need to get that wetland delineated. You, there might be permits associated. You need to know what it looks like. And the best way to do that is to go out and see it. So I'll do trainings like that, as well as trainings that are more like seminars, workshops, conferences. Um, so it's education and development, professional development for decision makers. And I focus on three big areas, stormwater and water quality, wetlands and wetland issues, and then climate and climate resilience. Um, 
so yeah, that's that's what my job looks like most days is like, you know, people sitting around talking, but that's really um, how we can get decision makers the information and the skills and the data that they need to make informed decisions. Um, so one of our most popular programs is the Master Naturalists. This is um, this is run through our stewardship program, and our stewardship coordinator, Jen, is in charge of our Master Naturalists. It's, um, it's like a 10-week training course where people learn about all of the different ecosystems and um, environments of our local area. So Master Naturalists might spend one week learning about reptiles, and the next week learning about plants, and the next week they're going to focus on birds and bird watching. Um, it's a really great way for people who are new to the area to sort of like learn what kinds of things live here. It's a really great way for, um, you know, if coastal professionals like want to be more familiar with what sorts of environments are around here, they can get a lot of exposure to that. And it's a great way for people to um, get engaged in the community because there is a volunteering component to it. So you can see up here they're building rain barrels to help with stormwater management. Um, so if you've never done it, if you're interested, Master Naturalist is a lot of fun. You learn a lot. Um, it's, it's like lots of field guides and time outdoors. It's a really a, a great time. Let's see. Um, and then I would say really the, the core of the reserve's mission is focused on research. So I want to touch on that a little bit. We are part of um, what's called the System-Wide Monitoring Program, or SWAMP, because we love acronyms. Um, and that's at every reserve. You remember all 30 reserves across the country. So we have a few different stations throughout North Inlet and Winyah Bay. Um, here's our Winyah Bay station. If you've ever gone boating out there, maybe keep an eye out for it. It's this raised platform, and it measures water quality at the bay surface and bottom, which is really cool. Um, Thousand Acre is this one right here, and then we have three throughout North Inlet in Debidoux Creek, Oyster Landing, and Clambank Creek. And what these stations are doing is monitoring water quality every 15 minutes. Only at Oyster Landing do we have a weather station, but it's taking atmospheric readings every 15 minutes. And we measure nutrients every 30 days. And if you've ever done like a basic water quality test, maybe for like a fish tank or aquarium, maybe you've like done the drops and it changes color and you get like your pH reading or something like that. This is like that, but on the next level. Like these are very sensitive, expensive, high quality instruments that we're putting out. So this data is really solid, it's really reliable, and we're taking it very consistently. And we're using that same approach across the entire country. And this is important because so many things depend on the health of our estuary, right? All of the tourism, the fisheries, all of those ecosystem services, a lot of it just comes back to like, is the water clean, is it healthy? And we need to monitor that so that we know if there's changes, if there's some big thing going on. The reserve is gonna be, you know, probably the first to, to know if there's some big shift happening. Um, and all of this data is available, it's accessible. You can go dig into it if you want to. Um, you can find it through the, um, the NEARS, CDMO, the Centralized Data Management Office. Um, but this, this website hosts all of our system-wide data, and you can go and see it in real time, that every 15 minutes, that's going up to a satellite, and then boom, down to this website so you can see it. Um, and you can also look at long-term patterns. There's this graphing tool that you can use that lets you say, um, you know, what happened to water quality during Hurricane Florence? Remember that a few years ago? We saw some crazy dramatic water quality changes after that event. Um, and you can see all that here, or you could compare. You can say, how does Winyan Bay compare to the Ace Basin down, in, down around Charleston and Hilton Head? You can go and look. Um, 
Let's see, I don't think I have a handout with this URL, but I'm gonna share this PowerPoint to the library afterwards so they can, they'll share that as well. Okay, so here's an example of how you can do a comparison. Um, we looked up who had more sunshine this past August, North Inlet Winnie Bay or the Ace Basin? And it looks like, okay, if the blue is us and the blue is higher most days, we had a lot more sunshine in August compared to the rest of the state. Um, and you can ask all sorts of questions like this, not just about sunshine, but about salinity, water temperature, air temperature. Um, it gets really interesting when we have like a tropical storm or a hurricane, you can go in and see really cool stuff. Um, this is like upside down. <laughs> you can also see salinity and this is at these are all 30 different reserves across the country. So it looks like Winya Bay, you can see, is like much less salty than North Inlet, which tends to be more ocean dominated. I mean, this is just an example of like all of the different types of data that we monitor, and then we can use it when we have research questions. So a lot of what we do is like, we'll have some sort of ecological question, like, um, I mentioned I'm working on a, a shrimp fisheries project, so how has salinity changed over the past few decades and what does that mean for shrimp? We have all of this environmental data that lets us go back and, and dig into that question. And then another big area that we do a lot of targeted research around is related to sea level rise and long-term changes to the salt marsh. So the salt marsh to me, like that's the South Carolina coast. I mean, besides like the beaches and the Grand Strand, the salt marsh is really like what I think of. Um, so we're really interested in how the salt marsh will respond to changes like sea level rise. Um, so we have these long-term monitoring stations. You can see this skinny, skinny boardwalk. That's literally a boardwalk that's like a plank of wood and it goes all the way out into the marsh and our researchers like go out there on regular intervals to monitor the plants. They have been meticulously tracking these plants. You know, they'll count every stem, they'll measure it, how tall it is. Um, and that tells us about the health of the marsh. Is it keeping up with sea level rise? Is it um, building up sediment around itself to like stay at that, there's sort of a Goldilocks zone. Um, if it's too deep, they'll just sink and the grass will die. If it's too shallow, other plants will outcompete it. So we, we keep track of stuff like that. And we use very cool tools to do this. Um, this is our reserve manager, Eric, with a drone and our research assistant, Brittany, analyzing drone data. So they're looking at how they can um, use aerial imagery and, re and not remote sensing, but like they can sense um, how much biomass the marsh is producing. So we're, we're out there with our boots in the mud, but we're also doing like very high tech things. <laughs> and then we do a lot of ecological research too. Um, our research coordinator, Robert, does a lot of really cool stuff with um, commercially important species like shrimp and blue crabs and oysters. So he's looked at the effects of re recreational harvesting on oyster reefs. So, you know, what's the impact of everyone going out harvesting their oysters for an oyster roast in the winter? Um, what does that mean for all of the little creatures that live in and among those oysters? Um, and then what are the patterns and drivers of salt marsh crab communities? Basically, if you've ever gone out in the salt marsh and you've seen that little like stampede of fiddler crabs as you walk, they like run away from you. Um, but like, what, what are their lives like? What did they depend on to survive? He does a lot of um, research that sort of answers questions like that. And I have um, sort of a favorite like technique that he uses. It's called a pitfall trap, which is literally like a tennis ball can and you dig it into the ground and then the little crabs fall in there and then you can go collect them and like measure them and research them. Um, and then a really big, research area that the reserve focuses on, and this is less in the estuary, but rather in the watershed, 
but it's all connected, right? Like, so we focus on our human communities and our systems for managing stormwater because all of that ultimately is gonna make its way to the bay. So we do a lot of research around stormwater and like stormwater ponds. So you've probably seen like an HOA neighborhood that has those stormwater ponds, maybe they're bright blue with like a fountain in them. So that's our main approach for managing stormwater. Um, and when it rains, all that runoff goes into that pond, but eventually that's gonna make its way into our natural waterways, the marsh, the Waccamaw River, Winyah Bay. Um, and we do a lot of chemistry around those ponds, like how well are they cycling through nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus that can lead to algal blooms and stuff like that. Um, so that's a big focus for us. And all of this research and education and training, ultimately that is um, working towards our goal of stewardship. And stewardship, let's see. Yeah, and we promote stewardship through science and through education and stewardship is the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. So we're really all stewards of the bay because we all live in its watershed. Um, and that's, that's really the heart of what is driving everyone at the reserve. It's another definition. <laughs> And so we have a lot of ways for people, if they want to get actively involved in stewardship of the bay, we have a lot of volunteer programs and citizen science. Um, so some of our volunteering opportunities include this program called Adopt-A-Stream, and that's about water quality monitoring. We have volunteers that go out to like designated sites and they have a kit with all the different chemicals and tools they need to measure water quality. Um, we have um, phytoplankton monitoring volunteers, and this is a national program where folks go out with a plankton net and they collect all of the little microscopic algae that float in the water of the estuary. I actually help out with this one because my background ha had a little bit of um, like plankton studies in it. Um, and honestly, in just a drop of water, it's full of like all of these beautiful little algae um, dinoflagellates and diatoms. And this is the base of the food web for the ocean, but also some of these guys can produce toxins, like that's how you get a harmful algal bloom or like a red tide. Um, so we want to monitor to make sure we're not having like one of those blooms where they produce toxins that can be harmful to human health. We do a lot of cleanups. Um, plastic pollution is obviously a big concern for the health of the estuary, and one of the best ways to um, combat that is just through cleaning up litter and getting that out of the watershed. Um, we have one coming up on September 18th. I'll be out there along Highway 17 picking up trash. Um, but we do these pretty regularly. And then we do family fishing clinics where we partner with DNR. And it's really the goal of that is um, learn to fish for the first time, get kids introduced to fishing, teach them how. And we need volunteers. Um, maybe if any of you are experienced fishers, um, we'd love to have you help out and teach some kids. And then, sorry, besides all of the volunteer programs that we run, we have a sort of newly formed friends group called Inlet and Bay Stewards, um, or IBIS, because again, acronyms. Um, IBIS sort of formed shortly before the pandemic and it lost a little bit of momentum, but they're really trying to um, come back together and through IBIS that we're hoping to build up a, a volunteer group so people can come out and help Beth and Haley with um, education programs, you know, sometimes we just need a few more folks to keep an eye on a whole bunch of kids out there in the marsh. Um, so IBIS, I think, will be a great way to get involved if anyone is interested in that. So obviously, one of the best ways to find out about everything going on is just go to our website. We have an event calendar for all our public programs. You can learn about all of our different um, 
sectors of research and training and everything. There's a whole page about how to volunteer, so check out our website. And um, we mentioned it's our 30th anniversary, so we put together a story really just telling about like how the reserve was formed. It was designated in 1992. And we've had some big milestones over the years, um, building the near wing so that we actually have like permanent facilities here, adding the Discovery Center so we have a public space for visitors. Um, so you can go and see photos throughout the years. And then we really want to invite you all to come to our open house. This is like one of the biggest ways we have to just get a ton of people back behind the gate to come see the reserve. Um, it's a family friendly event and it's going to be on Saturday, September 24th. I know there are other things going on that day, like the Adelaide Arts and Crafts Festival. Um, this could be a really fun thing to do after that. <laughs> um, it's from 9 to 2 at Hob Barony. We're gonna have face painting for kids, tours of the reserves, we'll take you back on a bus. Um, we'll see animals, you can come see the lab, see all of the like really high-tech chemistry equipment we've got on the property, um, go out into the marsh. So it'll be a really fun time. Um, so please, you know, bring your friends, bring family. And I think that's everything I wanted to uh, share with you all. I realized I never mentioned seeds, so I just want to point out that we have a volunteer program that we do with kids called Seeds to Shorelines, where they plant Spartina seeds, which is that salt marsh cord grass, and then they take it back out and transplant it in the marsh. So boom, seeds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, question. Yeah. Um, okay, you did an excellent job. Thanks. Um, I just have, uh, I have so many questions. First of all, the one thing I want to mention is that um, in the kit, uh, not in the kit, but the Hampton Plantation for mm -hmm. five plus years did a dig uh, to discover the landscape of Hampton, and we spent five years in your cottages. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. 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 There's, there's nice cottages out there. <laughs> so we, we mm -hmm. went back and forth, and that's where we spent our uh, dinner and our night's sleep. Um, the other thing I want to say real quickly, because I, I, I like your approach, but I met with two different organizations that I don't know if you partner with them at all. One is um, the uh, emergency readiness team, the Red Cross, mm -hmm. because we have a lot of issues to recover in recovery because of everything mm -hmm. going upside down. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, do you ever partnership with the emergency readiness team or the Red Cross? I haven't before. I think our so um, last stop was, was a, a Zuzu. Yes, I know that um, our our sort of our lab um, coordinator. He will work with our local emergency departments to because we have so much like infrastructure right there on the edge of the marsh. We've got boats and you know data servers and stuff. He'll work with them on a plan for that. But we haven't been engaged in like emergency response in the community as much. My program deals a lot with like planning for resilience, like how do we plan ahead to not, um, you know, run into these emergency well, situations. We are what we call blue sky. Believe me, we do prepare, but the preparation doesn't always work because mm -hmm. sometimes the hurricane is so massive. Yes. So we are like around the year type of prep. Uh, the next thing I want to ask you is uh, another that I've been getting involved with, or at least know about, because I'm a victim of it, is Ayers property. Mm -hmm. you ever, mm -hmm. never, I, do you ever have any connection with Ayers property? It's possible Beth and Haley might talk about that with public programs as much um, sometimes. Not not much, and I mean, I will say, you know, the the Clemson or sorry, the uh, Coastal Carolina and Francis Marion Institute is much more focused on like human and um, historical issues. And I, and I, I will, I'll explain to people because people will just say, "What's well, just?" Oh no, yeah, it's, I I didn't know until I, I moved here. About, um, after slavery, the African or uh, free Africans didn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Basically, the, the benefit to the planter would be to keep them there. So they were uh, sold maybe for a little bit of money or given land to maintain the rice fields or whatever. 
So there was no uh, particular um, need done. Like if I have a family of 20, I don't have 20 deed lines. I got one deed line. So the, the whole plot belongs to the whole family. And that seems to be simple and nice, but it isn't because if one family member dies, then it's going to be the uproar. Who's going to get on to that? So anyway, that's what A.S. property is. And, mm -hmm. and it's been going on since the end of slavery. Mm -hmm. At the end of slavery, we started doing A.S. property for African Americans. So anyway, so while we have big storms, we got to figure out who, who house got messed up to give them the funding. Mm -hmm. You know, so it gets to be really crazy. So anyway, well, that's all I want to mm -hmm. say. That's it. Yeah, no, I mean, I, the, the reserve, we're definitely trying to, um, you know, better understand the history of our community. And I, I know um, I recently read like a whole history of Hobgaw Barony because I was like, you know, I work on this place. I, I think about like the ecosystems here, but I don't really know much about the people that lived here um, throughout history. And so I've, you know, we're all trying to, to like better understand that. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I think Ayers property, you know, gosh, that's so important to like all of the resilience and environmental justice in this area. So we haven't worked on it directly, but I'm happy to chat more about it. I, I love to chat more yeah. with you. Yeah. This is an ex extremely exciting project because um, marine, bio marine biology is my, my thing. I love marine. Yeah. I love marine. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll share. Okay. <laughs> I love the fact that this program mm -hmm. is for kids so they understand the impact of our behavior as mm -hmm. humans. Yeah. And it worries me, you know, I live in rural Georgetown here, but when I drive up to Myrtle Beach, there just seems like there's so much, so many houses going up mm -hmm. everywhere, so much construction. I'm like, is this going to have an impact on the whole, um, you know, ecosystem, because there's so many people. I do know that I was listening to NPR about the situation, and they were saying the more construction that goes on in Myrtle Beach, then what happens is there are parts of Conway that flood. Mm -hmm. And at some point, is there some entity that's going to try to put a cap on that to, to stop? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, my program deals with this topic a lot because yeah. um, essentially, like that increased development increases the amount of impervious surface. Every driveway, every roof, like that, that's less room for water to soak in, and that leads to more runoff, which is more flooding. More alligators come up your block. Yep. Yeah, no, for real. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that you can deal with that at so many different levels. Like at the level of a single house, you can plant a rain garden or install a rain barrel. Um, at the level of a neighborhood, you can, you know, use different infrastructure tools like a bioswale is like a, you know, it's like a vegetated ditch essentially, but it's engineered to like promote infiltration. At the community scale, the um, local city or county government can manage that through zoning and planning. So, I mean, it's really, it's very complicated. Sure it is. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But but that's I mean that's what a lot of my workshops, webinars, trainings like they deal with that. But um, because I didn't realize it, I just recently came from the Midwest. But when there are storm surges here, this marsh land here acts like a big sponge. Yes. <laughs> soaks up all that water so it doesn't come flowing you know farther out mm -hmm. like, i never thought about that but you know i'm like well is somebody trying to put a stop to this i don't know mm -hmm. yeah i mean that's <laughs> I, that is a hot topic right now for sure <laughs> yeah because i think you know i you know i'm i'm 71 i'm like you know but how about all the young people that are not gonna be able to see this Mm -hmm. For them, you know, they won't be able to enjoy it like we can now. Yeah, I mean, that's why, you know, the reserve with our different programs, I feel like our research is sort of like monitoring those changes and then 
my program is sort of like, okay, what can we do with it through like infrastructure and planning? And then our stewardship program is like, how can we help people to take care of what's here? So we, you know, and then education is like, let's let's teach kids to to like appreciate it. Gave us this, and we're bound and determined we're going to screw it up. Mm -hmm. And it just it makes me kind of sad. But the fact that you have young children that come out there, you can plant the seeds mm -hmm. of you know things that we should be doing that maybe we don't think about. Yeah, I feel like the antidote to that is to do something, and so that's why we want lot to provide lots of opportunities. Yeah. And. And what you do specifically, your program, the, the CTP, yeah. <laughs> uh, is, to, is trying to outreach uh, and educate the adults, and the, especially those who are in charge of, of development and, and the planning, to try to get, try to influence that in a positive direction, right? For exactly. Like, I don't advocate for any specific policies, but it's more about making sure people are aware of the science and you know know how to use that information to inform decisions. So, so hopefully it's you know having an impact in that way. So it won't yeah it, it'll be a, we can save uh, more areas and and keep them pristine for the future mm -hmm. and not it not have have this continue to pile up and be a problem. It affects the birds as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and we have we have a lot of birding programs that are really popular. Um, but yeah, yeah, shorebirds are really struggling right now. Um, we have a lot of really great shorebird nesting habitat in North Inlet, again, because we have some beaches that you can really only access by boat, and that's where they really like to nest. So um, yeah, yeah, definitely come out for a birding program. I was reading a book about you know, bird migration, and I had to put it down because it was like all over the world, if we think it's bad here, all over the world, you know, the, the marshlands are being Mm -hmm. destroyed. Mm -hmm. So that is huge for the birds of the world. Mm -hmm. I just want to interject, and I don't know if it has anything to do with anybody here, but mm -hmm. I live in Belle Isle, and we have a lake behind us. Mm -hmm. And I discovered a dying alligator one day. Oh. And I didn't know who to call, who to turn to. And when I did finally call our HOA, he called someone in the government who had something to do with that. Mm -hmm. And when I spoke to her, she said to me, take the body and dump it in the, in the uh, wasteland, in the landfill. But doesn't anybody do research on something like that? If you find an animal that's dying, isn't there anyone you can contact? <coughs> yeah, well, go ahead. Good answer. Uh, one thing, I won't touch. Um, because I don't know what they're dying of. And second of all, uh, I saw an alligator on, all, on front, off of Swan Street, and I called the uh, police department, and the police department called uh, natural resources. That's what I called. You called natural resources. I'm pretty sure that's, you, that's what you told me. Because when animal is dying, you don't know if they're contaminated. With she told me either call them or call animal control. Well, that, that's right. Yeah. And they didn't come to get it. That's not right. <laughs> That's not what you're supposed to do. I'm sorry. No, I, yeah, I, I was going to say basically the same thing. Like, usually when it's alligators, I think DNR is the best contact or just like, yeah, local county animal control. Okay. There is a researcher at the Clubson Baruch Institute who is like a crocodilian researcher and he studies alligators out at Yaki, which is another big natural area. Um, which is just really cool, just really neat to do research on alligators. <laughs> and I'd yeah. just like to share some river oaks if anybody wants any. I know very little about them other than I know they help erosion. Mm -hmm. and the, so if anybody would want any, no? Yeah, know. native plant landscaping is wonderful for the you know, ecosystem. <laughs> I have river oats in my garden already, if anybody else wants them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, thank you all so much for, for coming out. It was really fun to chat with you. Um, I hope you will come visit us at the reserve. Definitely. Yeah. I didn't know we were allowed out there. I didn't know.
That's that's why that's why I'm here to like tell people like yes we have stuff you can do you can come out here, <laughs> and and I have um, brochures with our upcoming public programs and stickers, so feel free to grab one. Uh, thank you so much to Maeve and and go visit her out out there. Welcome is the yeah. is the point. So that's that's great and thank you all for coming. <laughs>